Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. Uh, my guest today is Ben Novak. He's a lead scientist at Revive and Restore. That's the website is reviverestore.org, and they're a leading wildlife conservation organization. They promote the incorporation of biotechnologies into conservation practice. I'm not sure what it means yet, but we'll get into that. So, um, Ben, thanks for coming. How are you doing? I'm doing very good. Thank you for having me. Yeah. What's your main uh, project or projects at Revive and Restore? I was brought on to Revive and Restore at the very beginning in 2012 to lead the passenger pigeon de-extinction effort. Um, however, since then, as our projects have diversified, uh, growing greatly into endangered species, uh, I have been working with black-footed ferrets, uh, also on heath hens, and now our Catalyst Science Fund uh, management with the coordinator, Bridget Baumgartner. So how, do you, how does the organization identify which animals not only are in danger of extinction, but which ones... Uh they have to save first or revitalize first? Well, luckily for us, uh, you know, we're not in the position of having to make the decisions on which species are in danger or not. Uh, the various conservation groups of the world uh, ha have formed a giant coalition called the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and that, uh, uh, otherwise known as IUCN, that group actually decides what species are critically endangered, endangered, threatened, or vulnerable. And it has a very rigorous way of figuring that out that's uh, scientifically based and takes into account uh, all of the current, past, and future threats to species. We uh, come in and look at the programs that we feel new biotechnologies might be able to enhance and improve conservation efforts. Yeah, so the de-extinction efforts, which formed our flagship projects, uh, fill one of those interesting niches where for over a hundred years now, people have been restoring populations once they go extinct, um, such as wolves in Yellowstone or beaver in the United Kingdom, but they haven't been able to do that for every uh, vital extinct species, such as the ones we work with now, the passenger pigeon and the woolly mammoth. That's where new technologies such as gene editing and reproductive technologies from embryogenesis to uh, primordial germ cell transfers, a lot of technical stuff just that just came about in the last decade or so can make new opportunities to expand upon what conservationists have been doing a great job with now for uh, many decades. Well, where is the... Um... The hold up. I've heard that you know certain species. There's only a few left, but they won't breed or they can't breed in captivity. So is this like a reproductive assistance? Is that one of the techniques or the strategies to ensure that the last few females of a given species, you know, can get pregnant and uh, produce offspring? Or what are you guys focused on? Well, right now we have um, on a number of projects, as I've already uh, uh, mentioned, our passenger pigeon project and our heath hen and our woolly mammoth de-extinction project that's headed by George Church um, at Harvard. All of these projects to actually succeed have to innovate new reproductive technologies. And those reproductive technologies are the types of things that would be immensely beneficial to endangered species, as you said, that are having a very difficult time possibly breeding in captivity. Um, or breeding in the wild to boost their numbers. And we've started in avian, uh, specifically to birds at least, we've started a Catalyst Science funded program at Texas A&M University. Uh, directed, that program is directed by Dr. Rosemary Walsam to actually start developing these techniques which work great in poultry for agriculture, but haven't yet really been optimized for wild species. So we're starting with 
uh, type of North American grouse, the greater prairie chicken. And those uh, that just got funded last year. And despite COVID-19 shutdowns impacting laboratory work all over the world, uh, our grouse flock at Texas started breeding this spring. And as soon as they start getting some eggs laid, they'll be able to start doing research. It was a luckily deemed essential research given the time constraints of those animals. So what do you think will be the most effective biotechnologies to help you know, certain species that are close to extinction? And, and quick question actually going back, what is the definition of extinction? I thought that uh, there's literally no living individuals of a given species left, but maybe it, it doesn't mean that. What does it mean? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, the history of the idea of extinction is, has changed uh, as scientific knowledge has come in. You know, there was a time when people, even scientists, didn't believe extinction happened at all. And paleontologists finding fossils of mammoths and mastodons and dinosaurs and, and bi- you know, biogeographers filling in the map of the world finally gave the data that, you know, there are species out there in which no living member exists anymore. And the, and the concept of extinction was made, you know, very grim and real. Um, today, biotechnologies, I think, are changing that definition a bit. Uh, in the early 1900s, people finally developed the ability to cryopreserve cells from living uh, individuals. And in the 1970s, people started doing this for endangered species, notably the San Diego frozen zoo. So there are species out there today that have gone extinct by a conventional definition that have living cells frozen away in these frozen zoos. And with biotechnologies like the types we're working on for the grouse at Texas or what George Church is working on uh, for the woolly mammoth, you know, if those reproductive biotechnologies become fully realized. You talked about different species in the woolly mammoth. And I, I know George Church is trying to, I guess, restore woolly mammoths. But what would be the mechanism by which you take frozen um, embryos or frozen cells and, and reconstitute a whole organism? Like, who would carry it to term? You know, you, do you look for a, another creature that possibly you could, uh, you know, implant with this, with this embryo and it could carry the creature to full term? Those cells in the frozen zoo, um, with these new biotechnologies, and particularly using surrogate mothers or mothers from other species, you know, a species could now go extinct. And with a reproductive technology and a surrogate mother, you could give birth to that extinct species. And that really kind of changes our idea of whether or not a species is extinct or if it's just on ice, so to speak. For the woolly mammoth project specifically, um, George Church has plans to actually completely remove the need for a surrogate mother and develop an artificial uterus system so that a baby mammoth could be born without having to use a living Asian elephant, which is an endangered species, um, to give birth to that, to that uh, offspring. And that type of technology could be radically transformative for conservation, uh, especially for very rare species, not just the extinct ones. So what, George Church wants to create a literally like an artificial uterine environment that could carry uh, an organism to full term? Exactly. Um, They're beginning those studies with mice, as most studies start. Uh, Even our other projects are using mice to explore how we might be able to engineer disease resistance for some endangered species. Um, So, yeah, you know, you start these programs experimentally, make some some ground and and proceed to your endangered species from there. But the uh, you know, that I think the it's important to note for George Church's work with a, a artificial uterus for a baby woolly mammoth, that just because the baby is not born from a surrogate mother does not mean it will not have a surrogate mother. Um, that's something that conservationists have worked really hard on over the decades to be able to raise uh, offspring of endangered species with adopted parents, or even in some cases with, uh, by humans acting as their surrogate mothers. Uh, this is really widespread in bird conservation, in which uh, hand puppets are used to raise birds, people in suits. Um, and 
no matter, you know, no matter how artificial these means might seem, they're done to simulate natural uh, parenting and natural family environments. And the results have been really great for many species. So, uh, you know, those, those babies can grow up and full and they just readily integrate into their own herds. They can be released into the wild and they breed well. And, and ultimately the means to which people have gone to save species has been continually innovating and pushing boundaries. So for the animals that uh, you're working with specifically, what are some of the new strategies that, that you're going to employ to bring them back to culture them so that there's enough where they're not endangered or critically endangered anymore? Well, for our programs, uh, you know, with endangered species, there isn't a real need to, to innovate a lot of new techniques uh, because the one nice thing about an endangered species is that if you're, you know, if you're creating a, a disease resistant black footed ferret, there's no reason to raise it by hand or try and give it some type of uh, other species to be a surrogate because they have those animals breeding in captivity at zoos all over the United States. So they have families they can go into. For something like the extinct passenger pigeon, you know, there are no living pigeon species that have the exact same uh, reproductive biology and behaviors that the extinct species had. So we have to come up with some some new strategies to raise a new generation of passenger pigeons. And one of those strategies is training living domestic pigeons to breed in passenger pigeon colonies or, you know, to breed in colonies in trees. And there are different ways that we can start to experiment with that um, in order to, so that the first generation of baby passenger pigeons that hatches actually grow up in a social environment that that brings about the traits that we want from that species. One of the other things that we can do to possibly facilitate that is using uh, recorded sounds, which people have used in bird conservation before. When people have tried, when conservationists have tried to get seabirds to colonize or recolonize islands for breeding, they've used recordings of breeding colonies and birds that pass by then are uh, fooled into thinking that that island has a breeding colony, and so then they stop and they breed. The same thing can be used for an extinct species. You know, for the passenger pigeon, they grow up in these very dense colonies of millions of birds, and that's something that we can't necessarily do with a colony of, you know, of domestic rock pigeons. We can't raise millions of passenger pigeons all at once. But the first few generations, the few dozen that we have, we could raise them in an environment with recordings that mimic millions of birds around them. So let's say there's an animal that, um, you know, it's, it's almost extinct because its habitat was destroyed. If you, even if you're able to repopulate that, that species, um, but it has no habitat, I mean, then what do you do with it? Would it go into a zoo? I mean, would it have to be in a, a curated environment? Or would, uh, you know, if its habitat is gone, then what? You know, or maybe uh, luckily you don't have to work with animals when that's happened. I mean, like, do you have to know the context in which, in which the extinction occurred in order to really figure out, okay, well, sure, we can bring them back, but then what do we do with them once they're back? So uh, um, the question of habitat is one of Revive and Restore's criteria for selecting a de-extinction or an endangered species program. You know, there has to be a means for these species to actually go back into the wild and fill their role. Um, so for over a century now, conservationists have restored habitats that have become degraded. Habitat loss being the one of the major reasons species become endangered in the first place. And some of these programs have been very extreme. So, uh, for instance, the Guam rail is a bird that uh, had to be pulled out of the wild because the brown tree snake was introduced to Guam and dev and just devastated the environment. And until the Guam tree snake is removed from Guam, which is incredibly difficult to do and is the type of thing that new biotechnologies might actually finally accomplish. Um, but until that happens, you can't put a Guam rail back on Guam. You can't put a Guam kingfisher back in Guam. So those species have spent decades living in, in zoos, in refuge in zoos. Um, and in recent years, the Guam rail was you know, uh, listed as extinct in the wild. And just last year, it was officially downlisted to endangered because it was able to be introduced onto another island that was uh, free of snakes and where the habitat was suitable. So in some instances, 
Um, you know, you transplant the animals to a place where it's where there's good habitat. Other times, people are actively out there restoring habitats. But in the case of say uh, wolves in Yellowstone or our project with passenger pigeons, getting the animals back onto the landscape is actually part of restoring the habitat because some species have a huge role in shaping habitats, and it's their disappearance that creates the changes in habitat that endanger other species. So there's a lot of complexities there, but conservationists have been doing these with conventional tools a great, to a great degree of success. In our programs, where we're trying to see where biotechnology can help, we're really looking at every bit of the spectrum. You know, these primordial germ cell technologies that are being developed at Texas A&M for birds, um, these are the types of things that can make it much easier to keep something like a Guam rail or a Guam kingfisher, which have to live in zoos for decades, from ever going extinct. Um, able to keep their genetic diversity frozen in the frozen zoo and then reintegrated once that species can go back into the wild, into its population to keep them viable. So that's where these types of biotechnologies are absolutely vital, is, is okay. to allow conservationists to really take full advantage of, of every tool they have to keep a species not only from going extinct, but possibly reversing that extinction if it happens. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think about that. You know, the, I just assumed the habitat was, you know, a given habitat would be destroyed by human encroachment. But, uh, you know, once a, a creature, let's say, goes extinct from a habitat or is not in it, that whole habitat could fall apart, you know, just because the numbers of that creature are, uh, are too low. I mean, so, yeah, there's a lot of dynamics. And you're right, putting it back, Will it even be sustainable if you do? So hmm, it's a very complicated Revive and Restore, So uh, uh, Revive and Restore's main office is in Sausalito, California, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And the San Francisco Bay Area actually has a great program, uh, you know, showing how habitat restoration can really, you know, change people's perceptions of humans and wildlife. The, they have been restoring the Presidio Park to uh, to allow the reintroduction of species into the middle of an urban setting, which uh, is something people really haven't thought about. Uh, another example of restoration, which really strains the human imagination, is one that Revive and Restore is uh, affiliated with through our mammoth de-extinction project called Pleistocene Park. Pleistocene Park is a 30-year-old habitat experiment in Siberia run by the Zimov family in which they have been actively reintroducing uh, grazing herbivores that haven't been in that area uh, in 10,000 years. And just by reintroducing the herbivores, they start creating the dynamic that converts the habitat from tundra into really lush grassland that is way more productive uh, uh, for supporting life, as well as changing how carbon sequestration is going on in that habitat. And what's really cool about that is, it's, it, is that it, it really highlights the need for, for biological interventions in modern times, is that the t conversion of tundra to grassland could be a climate buffer for thousands of years. That's exactly what it did for the past million years between warm uh, periods and cold periods back and forth. If we restore that habitat, the largest terrestrial habitat in the world, it would have a major impact on the future of climate change. So have there been a lot of, uh, you know, misguided attempts to restore a population somewhere just because, you know, scientists didn't understand all the dynamics of the ecology? Yes. Uh, you know, conservation's history has is scientific and and you know people have tried things without full knowledge and then they've learned their lesson and kind of reiterated until they get it right there are some examples where species were reintroduced into an area and the habitat wasn't yet uh restored to a point where they could be brought back there were times in which the wrong a uh, mix of genotypes were brought into an environment and they didn't adapt very well uh, but overall, in researching, you know, the history of conservation efforts so that we can learn the best practices when we innovate these new de-extinction or genetic rescue efforts, you know, overall, the history of conservation has been incredibly good. Um, and it's one of persistence. So, you know, the California condor program is a great example where some of the first introductions didn't work very well. 
they learned from it and they put them into the, you know, and now, now we have breeding condors for the first time in many areas in over a century. Another great example that employs genetic technologies like the type revive and restore is really pushing for the adoption and integration of is that of the Atlantic sturgeon in Europe. In the Baltic Sea region, uh, sturgeon were over harvested to extinction. And historically, it was thought that, you know, a, a European or Eurasian species of sturgeon would be the best one to bring back and put in the environment and repeated attempts failed. And then a team of scientists took the preserved remains of Baltic sea sturgeon from 2000 years ago, 1000 years ago, on up to the 1960s to study how that population had shaped, changed and evolved. And they learned that those sturgeon were actually from North America. Several thousand years ago, North American sturgeon migrated over to Europe and colonized. And then with that information, the team took sturgeon from Canada, transplanted them to the Baltic region, and now they've, you know, they had immediate success. The population is, tr sturgeon were translocated from Canada to the Baltic Sea, and those sturgeon have been thriving ever since. But, uh, when you talked up, I think it's Pleistocene Park, you said that uh, some restoration could be done in an urban environment. So any, I mean, I, I guess besides the obvious, like what are some of the challenges in doing that? Well, b before I answer that question, you know, j just to iterate for the editing that you know, the success of that sturgeon translocation was, was really made possible by that genetic information. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's the real cornerstone of what, uh, for Revive and Restore, of what could improve the majority of conservation practices is understanding your genomics of your species, not just their habitat needs and their, and their breeding biology, but when you integrate genomics into that science, you get the full picture and you can end up enhancing the entire field. Um, now for Pleistocene Park, um, you know, and other efforts that are trying to do huge habitat restoration, you know, the, the grand vision is something that needs the restoration of some of these extinct species. So that's where woolly mammoths come in is, uh, you know, you could bring back horses and elk and bison to Pleistocene Park, but none of them are large enough to topple over trees and open up new grassland habitat, which is what African elephants do in, uh, on the savanna. None of them are uh, large enough to create the type of habitat impacts that elephants do in their environment. Super megafauna, which went extinct in the Pleistocene, were amazing habitat engineers and, and counterparts to all the species we have today. And so Revive and Restore's vision for you know, the future of conservation is one that takes into account a comprehensive landscape of a habitat, not just the species that we think we you know, are restricted to working with today, but really thinking about what are all the species that make a productive, healthy habitat that has higher biodiversity, higher bioabundance and productivity, and what are the tools that get us there? Okay. Well, very good. You know, whenever I, I start asking about a subject, I always think it's a lot simpler than it is. It's always a lot more complicated. And this subject, conservation, restoration, I mean, yeah, it's, it's really tough. It's amazing what you guys do. What, what's the, um, the best way for people to find out more and to keep tabs on Revive and Restore and to see what projects you're working on and, you know, to donate if you take donations or, again, just to keep track? Yes, yeah, so Revive and Restore is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we rely entirely on donations. Any donation of any size helps. People can, you know, if people are interested in seeing the types of projects that we work on, everything from funding uh, projects to help corals uh, become more resilient to climate change, uh, black-footed ferrets to uh, resist disease and, and successfully recover in the environment to anyone interested in our various projects can see those projects on our website, find the donation page, and even join our mailing list for, for updates uh, to those projects and the ways that they can get involved, as well as you know, frequent our blog posts and our web updates. We have an annual report every year, a uh, great place to see what we've been up to um, that comes out in December every year. Uh, 
yeah so the website we also have a okay. uh, uh, revive and restore can be found on facebook and twitter excellent okay well very good well ben i appreciate you coming and the work you do is uh you know it's very useful very uh, helpful work so thank god there's people like you doing it so thanks for coming oh thank you for having me You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.